Mark Rutland, and Mark Rutland, you should Google him. He's had, he just has a wonderful life and ministry and testimony, but he's uh, just prolific um, with the thoughts and the ideas that God gives him. So this was a little book. I was going to bring it and show it to you. It's a thin little book. You can read it in a couple hours. And it's called Nevertheless. It was so encouraging. I thought, oh, I'd love to get Mark here to preach it. But that isn't going to happen. So you know what? I'm going to preach it. Hallelujah. This is part four in that installment on Nevertheless. So I'm sharing truths that he's brought out in his book. Of course, you know me. Put my own little spin on them. Um, and this is the fourth part. And this morning, we're going to take a look at Peter and uh, his first encounter with Jesus out of Luke chapter 5, the first 10 verses. So if you have your Bible, you'll want to turn to Luke 5, 1 through 10. And I'm going to go ahead and begin reading. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing out their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon Peter's, and he prayed him that he would thrust out a little bit from the land. And then Jesus sat down in the boat, and he taught the people from out of the boat. And now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. I want to pause for a moment before we go on with the story. Because up till now, um, Peter, he's about to be, have his name changed by the man he's about to meet. Uh, be Simon at this point. Simon, um, you know, he's, uh, he's indulged this preacher, Jesus. Um, but he's had a long night. He's tired, his back aches, his arms are sore. This isn't like a little spinning reel, you know. These are throwing big heavy weights and nets. He's been doing it all night long. And there's nothing heavier than a wet net. And back then, they, they didn't have that really thin, nice little filament type line. These were heavy, ropey <laughs> nets. Well, I just want you to understand the frame of mind that Peter's in. He's just washed out his nets. He's got them piled up in the boat. He's been sitting down, little break. He's, he was thinking, I would have been home by now. Here's Jesus. He wanted to use my boat. And so, okay, I probably missed breakfast. Um, but all right, it looks like he's done speaking. We're going to get on with it. That's where Peter is at at this moment. And then Jesus turns to him and says, turn, turn your boat out out to the middle of the lake. Let's go out into the deep water and let's catch some fish. Simon answering him said, <clears throat> Master, we have toiled all night. Again, let me pause. Do, do you see what he's doing here? He's being polite. He's, he is concealing his contempt you're a preacher, I'm a fisherman, I catch fish, this is what I do. I have fished all my life in this lake. There's no fish. Listen to me, all night, there's no fish. We took nothing. But Jesus is just looking at him going, just go out, go out, just go out. Deep, we're going to catch a lot of fish, let's go. And he's thinking, oh, God, these preachers, they drive me crazy. They don't know anything, but they're, you know, giving instructions. And the Bible says, <laughs> Jesus said, let's go out in the deep, drop your nets for a catch. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we've labored, we've toiled all night, we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, everyone say it with me. <laughs> Nevertheless. At your word, I will drop down the net. You can almost see him getting into a sing-song rhythm. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll drop the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, and their net broke. And he quickly called his partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came 
and began to fill the ships, both boats, until they both began to sink. Now when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down. At this point, they're back on shore. They're probably back on shore. They've managed to get the boats into shore. Thousands of fish, just picture it, the early morning sun, flipping around inside the boats. You don't have to look down in the boat. There's a mountain of fish in each boat, flipping and glistening in the sun. And Peter's just become rich. Peter, his partner, his, his partners, they've, they've just made more money in one morning than they probably make in about six months or so. They're in the, they're in the tall grass at this point. But look what Peter does. They get to shore, and when Peter saw the fish, he's standing there looking at it, and he turns around, and there's Jesus. And the Bible says he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Because he was astonished at all and all that were with him at the huge catch of fish which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were his partners, and Simon. And Jesus says to Simon, now you can see Jesus, he's <clears throat> probably got Simon by the shoulders and he's picking him up, gently just lifting him up. When he gets him to his feet, he looks into G Peter's eyes and he says, fear not. He's got that same look when Simon had said, we fished all night and caught nothing. And Jesus was just looking at him going. He's looking at him, got that same look in his eyes. He says, fear not. From now on, you shall catch men. I love that story. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's just, I love the encounter. There's so many things about it that I, I relate to. But let's distill this down to the point because the pivotal word in this whole series is nevertheless. These tremendous events in history where there was a hinge that took the people from the, the limited circumstances with all their locked up, paralyzed boundaries and opened a portal and flipped them into that great realm of capability and possibility where nothing is impossible, all hinging on that verbal fulcrum, nevertheless. So Peter had <clears throat> used the heavenly blessed word, nevertheless. So let me say to you this morning, God is far more interested in your obedience than he is in your zeal. Zeal's important. We like zealous Christians. We like people to be zealous when they get in church and worship. Well, we want to see that zeal. But when heaven looks at us, zeal's important. But obedience is much more important. When you can't muster enough zeal uh, to comply with what the Lord is asking you to do, guess what? A very simple act of obedience, whether you've got any zeal or enthusiasm or not, will do the trick. Obedience is all God needs to act through. You don't even have to like it. Just do it. Just do it. You know why? Because Jesus isn't trying to show off your piety. He's trying to show off his faithfulness. That's all Jesus is trying to show off. He's trying to demonstrate his faithfulness, not how pious you are. He just needs your obedience to open the door. That's all. <clears throat> Jesus didn't need Peter's enthusiasm. He needed his nets. That was it. You didn't have to like it. You didn't have to even believe anything was going to be. You could sit there the whole time and grudgingly say, this is stupid. Just Drop the nets. That's all I need. Don't need your enthusiasm. I need your nets. Jesus didn't need Peter's enthusiasm to draw the fish into the nets. Guess what? Jesus was going to do that himself. What did he need? He needed Peter's obedience to get the nets into the water. That was all. Now this is going to start dawning on you right about now. 
And when it does, it's going to bless you. It's going to bless you. Because remember that the word, nevertheless, is that heavenly fulcrum, pivoting away from the dominating, uh, the, the domination of lesser facts to the possibilities of higher truths. And we've seen it throughout all of these messages so far. So while the nevertheless of Jesus in the garden, remember, I would that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, I pivot to your will, not your will, but my will be done. Jesus, nevertheless, in the garden was a beautiful, loving, full-throated embrace of the Father's will. But the nevertheless of Peter? <laughs> Peter's, nevertheless, was a crude, eye-rolling compliance under protest at best. At least he didn't grumble out loud, but he used the nevertheless. Same word, same act. But the beauty of Peter's nevertheless is that Jesus didn't need Peter to generate enough positive faith energy so that he could work the miracle. Grudging compliance would do. And you and I think God is so concerned with our level of joy when we obey him and our level of faith and our expectation. This is really an amazing testimony because all Peter had, and he gave all that he had, was just grudging, grumbling compliance. But he did it. He did it. Is that not right? Because sometimes the nevertheless of simple obedience to Jesus is all that's needed to open the door to a miracle. That's it. The Lord's not going to use your fanfare to create the miracle. He's going to use his love. He's going to use his word, his will. He's going to do it because he wants to do it. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Here's Jesus explaining the simple, unvarnished engineering principle of a simple, obedient act to God. Jesus speaks in Matthew chapter 21. He's going to explain how simple obedience works. He says, what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The older son said, eh, nope not going to do it. I'm not going to go. But later on, he changed his mind and he did go. So just picture it for a minute. Dad says, son, why don't you go out and work in the vineyard all day today? I have other plans. And I wasn't planning on working in the vineyard today, so no, we're not going to be doing that. I'm getting together with my friends. We've got a couple things we're going to do. Go jet ski. We're going to have some fun. I'm going to get up and meet up with some other people. So no, won't be working in the field. Imagine telling your dad that, telling your father that. But, but as he leaves his dad, whatever happens, happens. He changes his mind and he goes and he does what his dad tells him to do. Now Jesus continues. And it says, then the father told the, older, uh, the younger son, the other son, you go. I picture the two of them are standing there. Says to the old son, I want you to go work a day in the field today. No, nope, not going to do it. Walks out. He looks at the other son, says, you go. That's all you, you go. The younger son, eager to use the opportunity of the older son's little rebellious, snippy attitude, wanting to score points with his dad, he stands to a crisp attention, snaps a salute, says, oh, yes, dad. I'm not like that dumb brother of mine. I love you. I love opportunities. I, I look for opportunities to please you, to do your will. And he's almost ready to break into song about how he loves to obey dad. And dad says, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Just, just go. He goes out. Guess what? He doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. There's a boy out there working in the field all day, but it's not the one who was 
saluting and heel clicking and, and, you know, making all these overtures. And so Jesus, after sharing this, he asked the question of the crowd that he was speaking to. He said, now, which one of them did the will of God? In a lot of our church experience, we would say, well, the one that was shouting and praising and, and declaring and confessing and doing all that. But Jesus makes the point, says, nope, the one who was insolent, the one who refused, the one who said, I'm not going to do it. I've got my own plans, but then turned around and just did it. He's the one who did the will of the Father. He's the one who got the blessing. The other one didn't get the blessing. Are you beginning to see that God is not nearly as interested in our pieties, not nearly as interested in all of our confessions and all those things that are important, they're good, but if, it, if when it's all over with, we don't do what we said we're going to do, <laughs> we haven't really obeyed God, right? You see, sometimes we think that our bold proclamations of submission are so impressive to Jesus that he overlooks our lack of follow-through. If I just confess boldly enough, and thought, the Lord is just going to be so enamored with me, he's going to be like, now that's praise. That's praise. That's a good confession. I love that. I've got that on tape. I'm going to play that back. That is excellent. But he knows that you're going to walk right out and you're not going to do it. You just like singing about it. You just like confessing it. Feels good, but you're not going to obey. So we sometimes think those bold calm proclamations, I will submit to you, I will yield to you, that the Lord is just, oh, I love that, love that woman. I love that man. Boy, they love me, I love them. That he just doesn't notice that you didn't do it. So in the same spirit of religious delusion, we also think that the Lord's too offended with our outbursts of protest when he asks us to do something. To bless us when we change our mind and turn around and do what he told us to do. That's what happened to Peter. He did what Jesus told him to do. And then he, because he was so rotten about it, he figured, I'm no good, I'm unworthy, leave me, go from me. But people, what I want to tell you this morning is that Jesus is not shallow. He's not shallow. He's not vain. He, man looks on the outward, but Jesus looks on the heart. Jesus is deeply sincere. He's practical. He understands us. He is um, he's not probing for our weakness. He's not probing to find something against us. He is probing to know the true nature and intent of our heart. And he knows it. it is, we are naked and open before him. And what he sees, he loves us. Even when he doesn't love the words that come out of our mouth or love the, some of the things he sees in our life, he loves us. And he is appreciative. Think of it. Isn't that amazing? God is perfect. You think, you know, the Lord created the heaven and the earth, and he, he got, did a great job and everything, but the devil came and messed things up, and now he needs our help. He needs our help. He needs our help to, you know, fix this wreck, fix this wreck of a world, wreck of a planet. He needs our help. So, um, you know, when uh, he needs the enthusiasm, he's a little bummed out. 6,000 years of human history, we've, we've just messed up his thing. And uh, so that's, we need to praise him a lot. We need to proclaim our, our unity with him and with his purpose and declare it, make sure people see it. Oh, praise the Lord, let us exalt his name together. But he is appreciative, he's deeply appreciative. Not because he can't get this done without us. Although I think there's many things he's decided he's not gonna do without us. But that doesn't require us um, jumping up and down all the time and saluting him and saying, oh, I'm going to do this. It just requires us going out and doing it. Right, Marty? Just go do it. Simple. And he appreciates it when we do it. He loves us. 
and he appreciates, he understands. Somebody say amen. amen. So when Jesus asks you to act against your own experience and your own expertise, that's what he was essentially asking Peter. Peter was an expert. He had years of experience. But Jesus was asking Peter to act against his own experience, against his own expertise. When Jesus asks you to act against your own experience and your own expertise, don't let familiarity with your routine harden you into automatically rejecting his request. Peter just automatically said, no. Why? Because Peter was the expert. Peter knew. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. How many times as a Christian, God has put on your heart, the Holy Spirit's put on your heart to do something, and you brush it aside. No, I know that's not going to work. I've done that before. Those people aren't going to be interested in that. We know better. We brush aside. Don't be so locked in to your rut, your familiarity, that you are not willing to do what he asks you to do, even if it is just completely contrary and opposite of what you know to be the way things get done. Now, a couple of examples are, how I many parents have said stuff like, I've tried building a prayer life with my first two kids, and they rejected God, so I'm not going to waste my time with this third kid. You know, I'll send him to Sunday school, but um, I, you know, I tried getting them together and having a little prayer thing, but I'm not going to do it. Didn't work with the first two, not going to do it with the third one. How about the person that says, you know, I tried sharing the gospel with my coworkers at work. Guess what? I got nowhere. I got nowhere. So now on my new job, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and let my light shine. We allow our trajectory to be formed by the disappointments, the things that didn't work, and we just keep ourselves. And sometimes we, we don't even realize we're on autopilot. We're on autopilot. We're, you know, when you were young and first stepping out, all you had to do was get a hint from the Holy Spirit. Oh, the Holy Spirit wants me to do this. Broom off, we went and did it. Now he's got to send three angels, give you seven prophecies, confirm it with eight scriptures, and then it takes a month to have you just think about it. Just chew on it. By the time you get around to doing it, it the moment may have passed. I don't know. But do you see, we sometimes can be our own worst enemy when it comes to receiving what God wants to do. How about this one? I know you're familiar with Jonah. Remember the prophet Jonah? God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Go over to Tampa. I've got a word from them over there. I want you to tell them over in Tampa that God's going to judge them. Their city's about to be judged. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? You, remember them? You don't want that happening to you, Tampa. Unless you turn to the Lord. So what did Jonah do? Jonah said, what? I've got to go tell. Those people, I'm not wasting my time on them. God should judge them. I'm not going to go over there and tell them. They're not going to listen. I know them. They're not going to listen. So he digs his heels in, but guess what? From the belly of the fish, he repents. Fish spits him out, and look at this. He goes to Nineveh and grudgingly preaches to them, ticked off, angry about it the whole time, and doesn't believe at all that they're going to repent. He is stunned and shocked. With Not only did the people repent, the government repented, the mayor the mayor called a fast and commanded the sheep and goats, cats and dogs to fast. You're going to fast your pets. You're going to fast your, your barnyard in them. The whole, everything within in them is going to fast, and we're going to call a fast for three days, and we're going to call out on the Lord. We are going to repent. And Jonah was like, oh. He was even mad after they repented. Guess what? God didn't need Jonah to like the people of Tampa. He just needed them to go give his message. 
That's all you need to do. You don't even have to like the assignment God's given. Just do it. Somebody say amen. I don't know why, but we have this thing we feel like, I have to be filled with zeal. And I have to be flowing in that high octane faith, high, high level of enthusiasm. God needs to know that I am his ambassador going and doing this. God doesn't need all that. He's not interested. Just get your net in the water. Just drop your net in the water. Somebody say amen. amen. Now the reason I think this message is important is because I want to tell you this morning that God knows you. He knows that you and I through life have been beaten down and we've been negatively impacted by the world. What that means is that there's a certain amount of cynicism in us. And I think especially in the hour that we live in, we look at what's going on in the world and many of us, you know, you talk about cancel culture. Some of us have sat in front of the TV and said, I cancel culture, that entire culture. Those people, pfft, kill them all, let God sort them out. You know, we, we have a certain amount of cynicism because of the experiences of life we've gone through. Do you know the Bible says God knows your frame. He knows that you're but dust. And if the Lord should mark our iniquities and sins, who among us could stand? God is merciful and he's understanding. But the one thing he must have is he must have our obedience because he works through the passageway of our obedience. He's, he knows that you've been negatively impacted by the world. He sees the effect upon your emotions and the very neural pathways of your mind have been braced up by negative experiences so that you have immediate emotional reactions when you begin to think of doing this thing that God wants you to do. Your, your neural pathways immediately like shark's teeth start embedding on you and you'd rather tear your own limbs off than go down that hallway and do what God's asking you to do. But he understands. He understands why we're that way. He's, he's not asking you to shake it off. Just shake it off and be enthusiastic with a, with a chipper, heel-clicking exuberance like Dorothy on the yellow brick road. That's not how he's, he's expecting you to go down the road and obey him. And you know why? Because you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I mean, I don't think God wants to bless a bad attitude or just grudging compliance. Well, consider this. Consider this. God is not planning on changing the people with you. He's planning on changing the people with Jesus. He's going to use Jesus to change him. He's not going to use you to change him. So, you know, if you don't have that fully ebbed, fully, fully orbed, rather, development of Jesus' love and faith, just go do it anyway. Just go do it anyway. Because he's going to use Jesus to do the work. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Now, I want to close with this thought. In the scripture that I opened up with, the narrative uh, about this whole encounter, notice that when they get to shore and that the, the fish have been caught and Peter's taking it all in, he falls at Jesus' knees. And he says, depart from me for I am a sinful man because he was astonished. He was astonished and the contrast of what God did in the face of how Peter acted was really impacting him. When Jesus picks him up and he says, it's okay, you're going to become a fisher of men, he prefaces it by saying what? Fear not. Jesus said to Peter, fear not. Jesus saw what was at the root of Peter's emotion was fear. Peter was afraid that by not being religious enough, by not being enthusiastic enough, by not showing piety and, oh yes, Lord, I think just like you. I was hoping you would say, let's go out and catch some fish and everything, because I'm your prophet. He's thinking, Lord, I'm not a religious man. Matter of fact, I'm a very sinful man. You saw my attitude. 
depart from me. Jesus said, don't be afraid. I don't let those things stop me. I don't let those things bother me. I can work that out in your life. I can get you through that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Hallelujah. He considered himself unworthy, but he was about to find out, hallelujah, that Jesus was happy with what Peter had done. And this was only the beginning of an entirely new life. You see, Peter's nevertheless had opened a segue for far more than a miraculous haul of fish. He had just passed from the old cynical world of hardened boundaries and limitations into God's world of limitless adventures of faith, walking with the Messiah. 